I do want to just say good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great, great morning. We were just talking earlier. Um, the weather is very emotional, but it's 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 still nice, nice weather. <laughs> and I want to just say welcome to our Change Maker Twenty. I always, as always, I want to thank you guys for spending your afternoons with us. If this is your first time, this is a platform where we get to chat with some of our subject matter experts in an open forum for all of you to ask questions and speak to them directly. And so we like to engage in conversation with, with these events, uh, with these conversations. And with that being said, head over to the chat function at the bottom of your screen and make sure to turn on your messaging to not just panelists, but to all attendees. Uh, and so if you guys are listening in right now, just give us a hello, just give us a hi, and let us know you're there. Today we have Rachel Parent, and I'm very excited to get to talk to Rachel. Rachel is an environment youth activist and founder of Kids Right to Know, which is a non-for-profit organization that educates youth about the connection between food and climate change while advocating for GMO labeling. She's also a media veteran and has given dozens of interviews, including a debate with Kevin O'Leary on CBC. And I think you were 12 years old when you did that, Rachel. I think I was just getting off training wheels. And so it's quite an amazing feat. Um, and you're also an international and two-time TEDx speaker. Today, we're going to discuss the new realities of climate change and sustainable foods as we do a deep dive into the many changes we've seen over the last few weeks and the long-term effects on this planet and as we look into the horizon. And so Rachel, uh, what are the impacts that we've seen over the last little bit on our planet? There's been, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for having me. This is such an honor and I'm really excited to be able to be on this platform and share some of the thoughts and ideas that we've been talking about. Um, our planet has seen incredible changes over the past couple of months because of COVID-19. And it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic to start to see these changes. Um, already we have seen, you know, animals coming back into areas that they haven't been for decades, streams, air quality, clearing up. Um, so these are some of the benefits, but we need to make sure that when we come out of this pandemic, that these changes are permanent by transitioning over to a greener system. If we don't transition to a greener system of food, of energy, then we're going back to the ways of normal. We really can't afford business as usual anymore. Mm -hmm. And for all you guys tuning in, if you guys have any questions related to what we're talking about, or for Rachel just as a whole with what she's been able to do, feel free to also let that uh, let us know on the chat below as well. There is a Q&A function that you kids can take advantage of for today. Uh, but Rachel, so can you give us a little bit of the status of what the, let's say the food industry has looked like, uh, particularly with GMO and sustainable foods, uh, especially with the way that people have been overbuying and hoarding potentially. And so what does the industry look like at this time? Well, we've seen a lot of changes. I think there's been two different aspects of it. Some people are switching to trying to eat healthier, mm -hmm. more organic real foods as a way to boost our immunity. And on the other hand, there are people who are, you know, overbuying certain types of foods that may not necessarily be so great for their own health or the environment. We're constantly seeing now um, advertisements for quote unquote junk food, things like Kraft Dinner, things like uh, Cheerios, all these sorts of foods that we know contain genetically modified ingredients, we know contain high level of pesticides and herbicides. Kraft said that uh, mac and cheese sold out more this year than it has ever in the past during this period. Uh, and this is just an indicator that we, we do have some problems within our food system and we really have to be looking out for our health and the environment, especially during this time. There are now mounting evidence that shows that being exposed to these chemicals in our food system is actually lowering, uh, lowering our immunity to things like the, this pandemic, as well as the fact that these junk foods that contain corn, canola, soy, sugar from sugar beet, um, they're contributing to things that we see all the time, like diabetes, cardiovascular disorders, uh, even strokes, and all of these are related to our food system. And so if we're going to make sure that we don't have underlying health issues, that we can fight off this pandemic that's going around, we need to make sure that we are looking out for ourselves. And I think that's where we've seen you know, consumer behaviors on both sides of the story where, you know, going towards comfort food or going towards healthier options. Mm -hmm. And so what are the bigger implications behind that? And if we are supporting the healthy alternative, which is better for us, what does that also mean for the planet? Well, I think we need to start looking at why is our food so cheap and what is the cost of that cheap food at the end of the day? Uh, when we're eating these foods and it's lowering our immune system and we're being exposed to chemicals like glyphosate, which 
is actually a registered antibiotic as well, we are truly damaging uh, our body and the way that it works properly, as well as when we're supporting genetically modified foods, uh, it's damaging our soil, our water systems, um, even you know, climate change. When we damage our soil, it releases carbon into the atmosphere and contributes further to the climate crisis. And most people don't know that our food system is actually responsible for 44 to 57% of all greenhouse gas emissions between factory farming, between GMOs, between cutting down our rainforest to grow this genetically modified soy, as well as nitrous oxide and fertilizers. Our food system is really contributing a huge percentage to our climate crisis. And so unfortunately, when we support these, this type of farming and this type, type of growing food, which unfortunately has been systematically ingrained in our brains that this is the way to grow more food and feed the world, which couldn't be any further from the truth, uh, we are inadvertently supporting the destruction of nature, the dying of our bees, our butterflies, uh, climate change expediting. And so unfortunately, that's the reality of, of where we're at. And if we can transition to a, a cleaner form of agriculture that benefits consumers, farmers, uh, then we would have a much better world at the end of the day. We need to make sure that we're transitioning to regenerative organic farming that supports soil health, that can actually draw down more carbon and make sure that we're preserving biodiversity. And so what kind of future do you envision coming out of this that can, you know, we can start making change now. I mean, this has, this whole event has been kind of like a reset and we've evaluated so many ways that we've gone about our methods and what we're used to, what we're programmed to do. Uh, and I think it's, it's it, there's, if there is a positive that's come out of it, it's, it is that reset. And so what are the positive changes that we can implement and have already seen over the last little bit? Um, I think positive things that we could implement are, again, investing in regenerative and organic agriculture. Uh, unfortunately, our government continues to subsidize genetically modified foods. And it's unfortunate because we know that our food system and our own health and the health of our climate and environment can no longer tolerate these practices. This industrial form of agriculture is not helping to feed the world. It's not helping to improve our climate, to help during times of drought. In fact, it has done the opposite in many of these cases. So we need to start looking at the root cause of this and finding the solutions that are really right in front of us. And that's getting back to being connected with the soil, connected with our roots and supporting local organic real farmers. Unfortunately, because of the food system that we've you know, landed in, uh, we have lost a lot of our local food economies. And that's why we see such a big problem with distribution where not everybody has access to clean, healthy, affordable foods. And that's really unfortunate that we've sort of put all of our eggs in one basket, relying only on big corporations. And by doing so, by allowing them to patent seeds and own nature, we've basically cut out small family farmers and organic farmers from being a part of the discussion and being able to feed people in the way that they actually have a better capacity to do. Um, so we need to invest in these, these real technologies of getting back to the soil and getting back to our roots and making sure that we are you know, really supporting these farmers who are, are benefiting the climate and benefiting consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and so then maybe you can help us debunk uh, a little bit of what makes it so difficult for people to, to eat organic or support local, which is the cost of it. And I know there are various methods or options that you ha we have where it doesn't have to be so expensive. Can you maybe give us a rundown on that? Absolutely. I think it is, again, unfortunate that organic foods do cost more at this point in time. But even five years ago, I started about 10 years ago now, which is wild to think about. But we've seen such a huge change. Organics then were still so much more expensive. Now there are options. You can go to Costco and buy organic foods in bulk that are very similar price point wise to regular conventional foods. And so there are ways of doing it. I know personally as a student, I've definitely tried to eat organic on a budget and I've managed to make that work, actually spending less than the average person does on groceries. I find first of all, that foods are more nutrient dense. So you are more full for a longer period of time. Often it's not just empty calories. And the food that you make is more nutritious and you tend to waste less because you know that it was a slightly higher price point. Um, I do find that a lot of people will buy a lot of things and end up wasting a lot at the end of the day. So it's definitely cut back on that. And I've actually been able to save money by transitioning to real whole foods rather than processed foods. 
It's amazing. And so hopefully that's something we can all partake in moving forward, especially past this. Uh, and now let's maybe shift the conversation to climate change. Uh, even in the news, I think coal has been taking huge drops. And so we are looking and seeing the repercussions of, of what's going on on the fossil fuel industry. And as we shift towards renewable, what kind of future does that look for us? Well, we need to transition as soon as possible. I think one of the biggest mistakes we have made globally is, first of all, our lack of connection with nature. We have forgotten our role in nature and the fact that we are a part of it. We're not separate. Um, and our government continuously only prioritizes our economy. And it's really unfortunate because at the end of the day, without a healthy environment, there is no economy. We base so much of our money globally off of resources. And so unless we take care of our environment, we won't have that economy to fall back on. And that's why it's really important to start investing now in renewable energies and things like solar, uh, because if we don't transition sooner than later, we're facing massive issues. And these are things that generations before us never really dealt with. So they don't have the answers to give us. They don't have the, the things to point to and give us the wisdom to say, this is what we have to do. And so now it's up to us to innovate and make sure that we have those solutions. And I think in addition to fossil fuels, we do need to make sure that agriculture is part of the discussion because it is such a huge contributor to climate change and really doesn't receive as much attention. And so if we can tackle both of them by switching to renewable energies, by transitioning, especially during this time where our economy is on hold and where we could be training people to work in renewables and could be training farmers to work regeneratively, uh, we could really overturn the system that we have and start to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. And with, with that being said, uh, I think climate change as a whole is still a very uh, difficult discussion to have, which is unfortunate. But maybe you can enlighten us. Um, what is the worst case scenario? Say we continue going the path that we, we go through with regards to food and regards to climate change. What is the future that we're looking at in the worst sense? I think worst case scenario, we've already started seeing it. We're not living in a hypothetical world of climate change. We're already facing the effects of climate refugees, people who no longer can live in the areas that they, they have grown up in, that their families grew up in traditionally. Uh, we're seeing forest fires that are displacing indigenous peoples. We are seeing floods. We are seeing earthquakes. It's already happening and it's not some distant future issue that we often think, you know, is not affecting me directly yet here in Toronto. Um, but it is, it is beginning to happen. And, you know, people are dying of air pollution, people are dying of no clean water. And this is just a part of it. As we continue, of course, the natural disasters and, and all of that could potentially get much worse. But that's why we need to address this while we still have the possibility. The United Nations said that uh, we have less than 12 years and that by 2025, over 100 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty due to climate change. This, these are big numbers. Um, you know, over half of all plants and animals could go extinct due to increasing temperatures. So there's serious issues that we're already starting to see the consequences of. And if we don't get ahead of this, if we don't address it, regardless of who's on the side, regardless of, of corporate interests, then we aren't going to get anywhere. And that's why agriculture and fossil fuels need to be addressed at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and a question just came in, Rachel, uh, what do you think about micro, Michael Moore's film, Planet of the Humans? And do you or do we need to go beyond just renewables and talk about conservation and doing without? So I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. I apologize. I was actually planning on watching it tonight. I'm part of a few groups who weren't absolutely thrilled with it, uh, just because the general message from what I've heard is more of the fact that, um, you know, renewable energies aren't the solution, but then what other solutions are there? And I think, of course, conservation needs to be a part of the topic, but we need to be able to get ahead of all of these problems. So looking at agriculture, what we can do about that, moving towards renewable energies as quickly as possible. Of course, all behavior from consumers is going to have to change in some form or another. So whether that's cutting back on meat or trying to buy non-GMO, organic, low pesticides as much as possible. These are all little things that we can do, planting seeds, planting trees. Um, individual action doesn't always seem like it does a lot, but when you combine individual action by the entirety of humanity, things change. Um, not only that, though, I think we do need to start demanding more from corporations. I think we've definitely gone a little bit light on that aspect, and 
I think they have to be held accountable. The top 100 polluters are large corporations that have exploited nature and have taken for granted. The fact that we are facing climate change and mass pandemics like this is not a natural occurrence. This is the occurrence of exploiting nature and animals uh, to the point that issues such as climate change arises. And so if we can start to reverse that and call out these corporations, hold them accountable, while also working on these regenerative solutions that can actually mitigate climate change, bring down carbon from our atmosphere, I think we have a good chance. And so maybe you can paint us a picture. What is a better future with us having taken the steps forward and shifting conversation from worst to best case scenario? What is that? What are the implications for our world? What are the implications for our health? in terms of moving forward to a better future? Yeah. yeah. I think there aren't implications for moving towards a healthier future and economy. At the end of the day, um, these big oil and gas companies are abusing people as well. Uh, there are areas like grassy meadows and areas where uh, people are really facing the consequences of being near oil and gas refineries. So they're taking advantage of Indigenous people and people of colour primarily uh, in those areas. There's companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola that are taking water out of our ground systems for pennies. And this is taking advantage of the fact that we have water at our disposal. They're taking advantage of our food system by trying to own and patent. So by reversing some of these things where they believe they can own and exploit nature, we actually all benefit from it. Not only our environment, but all of us, because at the end of the day, we are being exploited as well by these large corporations. Mm -hmm. And maybe last question, adding regenerative agriculture to a farmer's already full plate, uh, full plate might already be difficult. And so how can we support farmers who are already struggling with labor and supply issues? Absolutely. I think uh, trying to support your local farmers, local and organic farmers as much as possible is a really wonderful um, solution. I know it's not always easy and not everyone has access, but if we can start to try and localize some of our food systems, it'll make sure that everybody has access to safe, uh, healthy foods. And the other thing that we can do to try and support those localized food systems is join a community garden. Just now, uh, the government announced that uh, community gardens are now an essential service because a lot of people do depend on localized food systems and making sure that they have access to food for their families. And so by doing that, we are supporting local organic food that is coming straight from farm to table. Um, and the other thing you can do is try and buy non-GMO organic as much as possible in your grocery stores. Again, I know it's not always easy, but if we can make small transitions, uh, these are things that we can do to support farmers um, in any way possible. Mm -hmm. And going back to my earlier question, more so, what is the bigger picture when we move towards climate change, move towards renewable, and what are like some of the bigger changes that we're going to see in our planet and our health in regards to what we can do maybe for the ozone, for the oceans, and for our own well-being? I think by moving towards these renewable energies and by moving towards regenerative agriculture, first of all, we're going to see less algae blooms in lakes and rivers, which is really important. We've seen eutrophication, which is the fancy word for it, um, you know, over the past few years, especially, and this is killing off marine life. It's killing off uh, biodiversity and, and animals that really depend on those water systems. Hopefully we'd see cleaner air systems. Uh, we would see uh, less of a climate change issue, less carbon emissions, of course. Um, and hopefully we would see more nutrient dense foods because if our food is naturally and organically grown, we're all going to benefit health wise from it. Um, there's, there's an endless possibilities for the amount of positive we see. And I think that's what gives me hope going forward is that we've really hit rock bottom in a lot of ways in terms of the fact that we are, we're seeing our oceans acidify, corals are dying. Um, marine life is facing, you know, extreme consequences our Amazon is burning, like there's, there's endless amount of issues, but a lot of these have simple fixes in terms of taking the power away from corporations. So hopefully that would start to cool our earth a little bit and we will see clearer water systems, cleaner air, and a, hopefully a better future for us all. Mm -hmm. And I know we might go a little bit over, but I'd really like to tackle this. So, uh, thank you, Michael, for um, you know, sharing a little bit of uh, just your input and you know, thanking Thanking us, uh, thanking Rachel for clarity and conviction. But Michael's question was really, what could be the most helpful for us as business owners and as consumers that would help you to uh, advance your advocacy and work? 
Oh, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think there's a lot of things businesses and activists can do together. And I think perhaps that's one of the things that we've been missing is, is the fact that we all do have to work together on this. It's not a one generational issue. It's not just about the youth or just about one particular group. And so if we can work together with businesses, with organizations, uh, we have a lot of hope in our future. So definitely get in contact with us in terms of what businesses can do to support. It sounds terrible, but we're always looking for donations and, and support with events, uh, always looking for ways that we can try and help you guys out as well to transi uh, transition to a, a cleaner company. Because I think there's a lot of potential for businesses to transition to cleaner business practices. Um, so the, the possibilities are really endless in that form as well. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Rachel, for, for answering that. And, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. I, I know there's a lot more that we can go over. And then climate change is such a, such a massive topic that we definitely couldn't encompass even, you know, even scratching the surface with just 20 minutes today. But definitely, thank you guys for tuning in. And if you do want to have Rachel work with the organization and maybe do something a little bit more in depth, definitely let us know, reach out, and we can help you book her for a custom virtual event or for workshops. And I'd love to help get you acquainted and connected. And so with that being said, we will be continuing our virtual speaker series with another change maker tomorrow, this time with Dr. Mary Donahue. This will be a continuation of last week's conversation. And if you weren't there, we go through the research that finds we only understand the meaning behind emails clearly only 20% of the time. Uh, and this is compounded by the problem of negative feedback that leads ultimately to a more stressful day. And so what her group ultimately identified is how you can reduce your digital stress by 10% and enjoy 76 more really good days of the year. And so it's really interesting and definitely if that's something that interests you, tune in tomorrow. But once again, thank you, Rachel, for coming on today and for everyone at home, stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.